Welcome, everyone. This is Dr. Mercola helping you take control of your health here today. We are joined by Dr. Meryl Nass, who this is her third appearance. Previously, she joined us in 2011, nine years ago, and then two years later in 2013. And today, she's going to share her wisdom in uh, what she's been working on for decades and how it relies it relates to this current pandemic. So welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. So you have uh, the reason we interviewed you previously was for your experience with anthrax. And um, many may recall the la this was the last scare that we had in this country was the 9-11 scare, the terrorism crisis that we had. And shortly after that, they launched these anthrax spores, which you had quite a bit of experience with. So, uh, and, and as a result of that, and, and I would definitely want you to relate the details because many of our memories are faded on this almost two decades ago now. And, but as a result of that crisis, one of the most severe compromises of our personal freedoms were initiated with the Patriot Act. And it's many people's concern that they're going to use this crisis to take even more freedoms away. And, it, and there's strong evidence to support that's what's it's precisely what's going on now. So before we get to that, why don't you get us, uh, refresh our memories on this anthrax component? Okay, that's a hard one because I could talk for hours on it. Uh, yeah, well, let's um, condense it because we got a lot of things yeah. to talk about today. Yeah, so it might be better if you ask me specific questions. Um, in any event, anthrax spores were sent in a series of letters to the media and to members of Congress, specifically to Democratic senators who were holding up the Patriot Act. Um, it had just come in. It was very large. Uh, I don't think anyone had even read it all. And uh, it... it it had been written quite a while before the 9-11 problems. Uh, but, you know, never let a crisis go to waste. So you bring in your, your rather questionable, controversial legislation when the country is in a crisis and you can make an excuse that the legislation is necessary. And that, that is what was done at that time. Um, a few weeks after the 9-11 planes hit, the, these letters were sent. and also people who worked in post offices and a very tiny number of other individuals who didn't work in a post office, it wasn't clear how they received anthrax spores, died of anthrax. So there are only about 11 deaths in the whole country and there are about 20 some cases, 44% died, uh, mostly because they weren't diagnosed early enough. So once everybody realized what was happening and they started treating people appropriately for anthrax, it, became much less of a problem. But the country was panicked because they didn't know if there would be anthrax spores in their mail. And they didn't know when another letter was going to come. And so this went on for about a month and created quite a hullabaloo. I, I, you know, I was interviewed multiple times a day and it was on television. It was a big deal. And then, you know, it disappeared. But in the wake of these two crises, of course, Congress has only one way to approach any problem, and that is to spend money on it. So uh, Congress app appropriated a lot of money for bioterrorism, which is con conjoined with pandemic planning. So this, the same pot of money that goes into pandemics goes into biological defense and biological defense, much of it is dual use, research performed in high containment BSL-3 and BSL-4 labs, um, so that we don't call it biological warfare, but when you're designing pathogens, microorganisms, to be more virulent than the originals in nature, and because the, the tools that are available through genetic engineering today make it possible to design almost anything, um, bio essentially biological warfare research gets done. Now, things are called biological warfare is if the intent is to create a weapon. Things are called biological defense if the intent is to design a bad bug so you can come up with defenses against that bug. 
what has happened is that a lot of money was spent to, de to develop new high containment labs, many, many more high containment labs. These are labs where you have to have your own air supply. You know, there can be the, the person working in the labs cannot breathe the same air as, as the air in the lab because there may be aerosolization of pathogens. Um, so this seemed to be an easy way to spend a lot of these billions of dollars, about six and a half billion dollars a year ever since 2011 has been designated for this biodefense. So what we wound up with is hundreds of biodefense labs that have to be used and thousands, uh, possibly 15,000 newly trained biodefense researchers. So now we have cadres of people who are experts in coronaviruses or avian flu viruses, Ebola, Lassa, etc. It's and what most of that money, six and a half billion dollars a year, has been spent on has been researching these pathogens. Even even though the money was supposed to be spent on developing countermeasures and stockpiling countermeasures, to a great extent that did not happen. When there was a countermeasure available, like an anthrax vaccine or a smallpox vaccine, and, a com and co companies existed who were skilled at getting sweetheart deals, then we bought supplies of, of anthrax and smallpox vaccine for the stockpile um, or a smallpox drug. But in general, there wasn't a lot uh, the, the bulk of the effort was put into research that was not directly designed to produce countermeasures. As a result, we, we know a lot about highly virulent coronaviruses that have been created in labs around the world, as well as in the U.S. and China, and we have absolutely no countermeasures that have been developed for coronavirus. Now, how does this relate to the two papers you wrote about 30 years ago in 1991 about biological warfare? Okay, um, so in 1941, it was um, scientists came to President Roosevelt and said, you know what, we're fighting the Germans and we should get into biological warfare too. We should consider that as one of the arrows in our quill. And it was agreed and uh, Fort Dietrich was established, uh, other institutes were established and um, scientists were um, brought in to start doing research on pathogens that might be used for biological warfare. You'll probably be surprised to know that Arthur Guyton, uh, famous, very famous author of a physiology textbook used by every student in the country when I went to med school, was one of these um, scientists who was, you know, in the military, called up for World War II and worked on biological warfare at Fort Detrick. So we had a program, we researched, we had organisms and we stockpiled them. We also had toxins, we also had chemical warfare agents. And that program persisted from 1941 until 1969. At that point, for a number of different reasons, one of which was our own use of chemical weapons in Vietnam that was getting a lot of pushback because there, there is a Geneva Convention that says we're not supposed to do that. And the loss of uh, over 6,000 sheep in Utah when a uh, chemical warfare test went awry and killed the, the sheep of a rancher, um, Nixon said, look, we're going, to we're going to end biological warfare. We're going to get rid of our stockpiles. We're not going to do the research. And we're going to encourage the rest of the world to come along with us. And we're going to initiate a biological weapons convention. Now, some say that was done because it was felt that the, the science was at such a place that the United States did not have an advantage over other nations in biological warfare. It was the poor man's atomic bomb. Anybody with a lab and a you know, graduate degree could make the same things. Be that as it may, um, the United States did initiate a treaty. It was signed by over 100 countries and but we destroyed our stockpiles to, to the best of our knowledge of biological weapons. And there was supposed to be only defensive research after that. Well, was that the 1987 treaty that Francis Boyle drafted? 
So um, it, it was the 19, actually, uh, 72 treaty okay. that came into force in 75 and Fran Boyle wrote enabling legislation to put it into law in the United States. Okay. Um, so he made it a, a federal crime to use bio biological weapons. Um, so things seem to be good for a while, but the United States realized that actually the science had now advanced and we probably did have an intellectual advantage against other nations and maybe this wasn't just the poor man's atomic bomb. And so there were gradual encroachments on the treaty and reinterpretation of the treaty such that um, gain of function research became acceptable. Gain of function is a funny term which means putting more virulent features into pathogens. So you can take a, a microorganism that causes disease, but then you can make it more virulent. You can make it go to different kinds of tissues or cells. You can make it transmissible by aerosol. You can make it more stable in the environment. There are, there are many different features one could theoretically add to a, a pathogen to make it more nasty, and I would call that more of a weapon. But we're not supposed to say it's a weapon because it's being done so that we can test our defenses against it. Uh, so that started to happen and more and more of it um, went on. After 2001, we built all these labs, we trained all these new scientists and the field just expanded. And of course, appropriately, the rest of the countries of the world did the same thing. And so now we have a uh, biological defense arms race slash biological warfare. Okay. So these biological safety labs, PSL labs, uh, come in at different lev levels of uh, security. Uh, the three and four are the most secure. And yes. the uh, purpose of these labs, according to Francis Boyle, is exclusively for the development of bi offensive biological warfare weapons. And I'm wondering what your views are on that. So yeah, in the late 90s, the federal government created a program called the Select Agent Program, and they assigned all the bad bacteria, viruses, fungi, et cetera, that could um, cause significant harm to the United States, either livestock, plants, or humans. And there's about 60 of them right now that the number changes. And if you work on any of those designated select agents, it has to be done in a high containment lab. So some of them are at the BSL-3 level, some are at the BSL-4 level. So that um, appropriate, for example, agricultural research could be done on agricultural pathogens that has to be done in a high containment lab. Now, you also have the potential to do um, research that could could make a pathogen worse, you know, and knock out somebody's rice crop or, or wheat crop. But um, basically all research on these living, these 60 or so living organisms, and there, some, of, some of them are not living but are toxins, is required to be done in these high containment labs within the United States by law. Okay, so you don't believe that they're all some of them could be biological, offensive biological w weapons, but you don't believe that's true for all of them. I guess what I'm saying is you're, you're looking at hundreds, uh, you know, probably at least 600 BSL-3 labs in the United States. You're looking at is more that, than a- is that, three, is that three and four or one, two, three, and four? That's three and three wow, only. Three above, three and, just, three, just three. hundreds of BSL-3s. Yes. Wow. And at least a dozen BSL-4s. Okay. Um, many of which are owned by the federal government. Plus, you have researchers that don't necessarily do one thing at a time. So they may be doing some very appropriate research, but doing something that could be creating a weapon at the same time in the same lab. Okay. All right. So why don't we transition to 2020 or 2019? Yes. And we have the SARS-CoV-2. And there's quite a controversy and debate or the whether this was uh, acquired, not acquired, but developed naturally through zoonotic trans transfer and transmission, or was 
facilitated through human hands. And I'm wondering if you could share your perspective on that. Okay. Um, like everybody else in the world, I wondered uh, at the beginning of this, whether this was a natural, you know, a jump from a bat or some other animal uh, virus to humans and scratched my head about it. Wasn't sure, I'm not a virologist. I can't read the detailed virology literature and understand it. Um, but I do, you know, have an extensive background in biological warfare, and I know what kinds of things have been created in the past, what it takes, where, they're, where they may be made, and, and how it has been done. So, um, so I remained curious, and then in um, the end of February, the later part of February, a group of scientists um, wrote a piece that was published in The Lancet, and it was a very curious piece to me. Um, it didn't make sense. It, and these were very prominent people, including the former head of the National Science Foundation, one of the former top people at CDC, and other very prominent people. Um, what they said is, um, we, we need to quash the rumors of uh, the fact that this came from a lab. That is, you know, conspiracy theory, and we need to get rid of it. We have to stand with our colleagues in China. We all need to work together. We can't start problems with the Chinese, basically. And so what this group was doing in a very short, less than a page um, brief letter was, was conflating the idea that this might have come from a lab with the fact that that would interfere with the U.S.-China relationship. And, therefore, and we couldn't interfere with that because we needed China's information and maybe China's products to fight the coronavirus. So we had to put this idea aside. Well, I scratched my head and said, That's, that doesn't really make sense, but okay, these are political people. Um, then a couple of weeks later, an article came out in Nature Medicine, um, which said, here, here we have the scientific proof that this did not come from a lab that there are certain things about this virus. And they talked about the two things that have been identified by others as the most problematic, these two sites on the uh, spike genome, which seem to enhance the um, tropism and the binding. So it, it just makes it easier for the virus to get into human cells. And they took these two areas and said, look, these mutations that are found in the new COVID 2 virus, which are not seen in any of the other bat viruses anywhere near it, must have come from the wild uh, because these weren't created in the ways that we virologists would have created it. We already have ways to create these things, and it wasn't done that way. And two, we did some uh, computer imaging and designing, and we decided that but based on the computer model, this was not the ideal spike uh, uh, formulation. And so if, if a geneticist, a virologist was doing this, they would have used the computer model and they didn't, and therefore this must have come from the wild. Well, you know, that, that was a really crazy argument. Because, because it didn't make any scientific sense. It was a lot of hand-waving um, assertions, uh, but the evidence was not there because clearly, if, if you understand that those were two highly virulent mutations that could well have been added to a, a pre-existing coronavirus, um, you would know that in fact, each of those could well have been added in a lab by a variety of techniques, including the old passage technique, which is what Pasteur used to make vaccines in 1880. So uh, passage has been around for a long time, but it is still used. And it's, it, there's a good possibility that it was used in this case, because if you take cells that are not, uh, if you take virus, sorry, viruses that are not particularly adapted to the human ACE2 inhibitor, but are adapted to another animal's ACE2 inhibitor, and passage them in, a, in human tissue culture with the ACE2 receptor, over time they will develop improved um, 
uh, receptor binding. So it, it's actually a likely way that that a corona that this coronavirus might have been uh, produced. So anyway, I read that article and I said, "This is you know complete nonsense. I'm, I can't believe Nature Medicine published it." And the two groups of authors, the, the one from The Lancet and the one from Nature Medicine, have consistently referred to each other as they've been interviewed. Science Magazine uh, did a short piece on The Lancet article. Um, uh, USA Today did a piece on uh, the Nature Medicine article. And then the actual head of the National Institutes of Health, uh, Dr. Francis Collins, wrote a blog post or somebody wrote it for him saying now we have the scientific answer this piece in nature medicine has put to rest any thoughts that this could be a lab construct that's a conspiracy theory we have no room for conspiracy theories um, this is the end of discussion um, so i i wrote a couple of blog posts about that and i said well this is really curious now the first thing I thought about the Nature Medicine article was, did these people actually write it? Because it's such a piece of scientific nonsense that any real scientist reading it, if you can read the language, would not accept it, would, would dismiss it out of hand. So, uh, you know, were they asked to place their names on this piece of junk in order to, you know, get it into a journal and create this smokescreen around the fact that this is a naturally occurring coronavirus. And uh, if you look at the names on the, uh, there were five authors, I knew of a couple of them. Uh, one was a fellow named Robert Gary, uh, who I have had some um, interactions with over the last 22 years. Another one was Ian Lipkin. And I happened to show this piece to a friend of mine, Ed Hooper, who wrote uh, a well-known book called The River. And he noted that the three other authors had all challenged, he, this book, The River, is about the origin of AIDS. What, what, how did AIDS jump into the human population? It's a fantastic and, book, fantastic book. Yeah. Um, and so, although the claim is that it's due to Africans eating bushmeat, um, Ed makes a very strong case and has made has put out additional evidence in the intervening twenty plus years since he wrote it that um, it's more much more likely that the jump into humans was because a pol an oral polio vaccine was grown on monkey kidneys in the Belgian Congo um, and that those monkey kidneys probably had the precursor to HIV. So it was interesting that three of these people, of these authors, had actually challenged him on, on his AIDS origin theory. And now they're challenging the coronavirus origin theory, which made me wonder, you know, are these people who have PhDs but can be pulled out by the um, political medical establishment to try to push, you know, uh, theories or ideas that are ne are politically desirable. So I guess I'll stop there. All right. So, um, well, thank you for addressing that because that those are the papers, primarily the Nature Medicine uh, article that almost every scientist is using to substantiate the fact that this is not, there is no uh, human intervention in this virus and it's just a bunch of hogwash. So, um, what then there's other components that another article uh, published in medium which is like really a book i mean it, would, it takes you an hour just to read the article uh but that goes into really quite deep science as to some of the reasons and and he's not a conspiracy theorist he doesn't even suggest that it is man-made but provides strong evidence that uh, one needs to consider before uh, coming to the conclusion that this is was nat of a natural origin, and do you want to go into that in some detail because it's uh, 
It's an incredible uh, article. Yeah, uh, a little detail. So uh, an author named Yuri Dagan, D-E-I-G-I-N, um, did his own research and published a massive um, discussion of all the coronavirus research that has gone on since 1999 that is relevant to the SARS-CoV-2. And he particularly discusses these two mutations, one the furin cleavage site and the other is the receptor binding area. And he talks about all the research that's been done on that and, and the different ways you can make changes and how changes like what we're seeing now have in fact been done by corona researchers over the past 20 years. Um, and he analyzes everything very, very finely. It's, it's like Ed Hooper's book. He sort of goes in and out and around and discusses every aspect. And when you finish reading that article, you are convinced that um, it's almost certain that, well, in my mind, maybe not in yours, that these two mutations were put there deliberately, whether they were done by passage, whether they were done by CRISPR, or whether another method was used, um, scientists did know the implications the, in terms of increasing virulence of both of these mutations. Um, so invite you to read that piece. <laughs> Just block a large amount of time. It's deep science for sure. We'll put a link to the article, uh, to, the, to that article in this, in the, the notes um so but it does provide some compelling evidence pretty strong compelling evidence and research that suggests that there, this was manipulated in some way and not of natural origin uh so um it it's uh i'm wondering what your so do you have any other thoughts on on its origin and how it might have entered the population because it it seems somewhat odd that it could spread so quickly if it was just zoonotically transmitted, almost instantaneously traveled throughout the entire world. Uh, right. Which just doesn't, so, epidemiologically doesn't seem to make sense. Not epidemiologically, last, but. No, you're right. Um, it, it came on us suddenly. Yeah. Um, last month, ABC News said that back in November, the intelligence community was noting a lot of things that were different about Hubei and Wuhan. Um, whatever signals they were looking at, cell phone messages, you know, people going to work, whatever, that they had a warning that something was going on there. So I think that's interesting if that is true. The ABC News said they had four sources for the story, and then um, someone in the administration the next day denied it deny that they had been given this intelligence. So I, I don't know. But um, so if we have to push back the date of when this started, uh, there are more possibilities, you know. Um, I, I don't want to say any more about the Wuhan World Games, except that they occurred in October and ended at the end of October. And there were uh, military members competing in, in a military Olympics from at least 40 or 50 countries in the world in Wuhan. Um, the other thing I want to say is just because an epidemic appears to have started in Wuhan uh, doesn't mean that it came from a lab in Wuhan. And let me give you a couple of other examples. Um, there was a, a sudden amazing instantaneous outbreak of cholera in Peru in January of 1991. There had not been cholera in the Western Hemisphere for almost 100 years at that point. And it started just about simultaneously in three, three coastal towns in Peru. There was a Navy uh, medical research uh, center in Lima, Peru at that time that, that some, you know, those particular Namru uh, research centers have been uh, accused of, of having a biological warfare as well as a biological defense um, purpose. You know, I, I don't know. But just to say, there was an, a U.S. biological lab, military biological lab in Peru when this outbreak started. Nobody pointed to that U.S. lab and said, 
the cholera came from that lab. When there was the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, and again, more than a thousand miles from where any Ebola cases had ever been reported in 2014, maybe 13, um, guess who had a lab in Kenema, Sierra Leone, right where the outbreak started? Robert Gary, the same Gary who was a co-author of the Nature Medicine paper who also had sort of fought with me back 20 years ago regarding the nature of the problems with anthrax vaccine. He and, and another person, um, even though he's a virologist, suddenly he got into the bacterial antibody and vaccine issue. And he did an experiment and said that the problem with anthrax vaccine was what there was squalene in it. Squalene is a it's a natural product, but it can cause autoimmune effects. Um, it is uh, one of the precursors to making cholesterol. So we all have squalene in our bodies, but it, where it is is controlled. He said, look, there was some, and squalene can be added to vaccines as an adjuvant to make them uh, stronger and so that you need to lose less antigen in the vaccine. He said, look, the problem with the anthrax vaccine, both in 1998 and back in the Gulf War was that they had added squalene to it. And that's what made everybody sick. And a book, a book called Vaccine A was written about that. Um, and I was harassed by the author of the book who wanted me to accept his, this hypothesis that the whole problem with anthrax vaccine was that squalene had been added. Now, the thing is, I'm no uh, fan of squalene in vaccines. Uh, you know adjuvants have side effects in some people. And uh, so I'm, I, I have nothing against that theory. It's just that there was other evidence that showed it was wrong. For example, um, people who actually got anthrax from the anthrax letters had a complicated group of symptoms in a way similar to this complicated group of symptoms the coronavirus sufferers have now. And their symptoms resembled in many ways the symptoms that people have from anthrax vaccine, okay? The people who got anthrax from the anthrax letters, there was no squalene in it. They just got anthrax spores. Um, the vaccine contained many different anthrax um, products, products made, it's a very dirty uh, vaccine. Anthrax vaccine is not processed extensively. So basically RNA, DNA, proteins, all sorts of molecules were in the vaccine and each batch was different than each every other batch. Um, and I believe that some of those products were what were making the soldiers ill. I think Gary came up with this theory because the idea was if, if that theory was accepted that squalene was the whole problem, well, then the government could just say, okay, we're, we're not going to make any anthrax vaccine with squalene, and now you all have to be happy. We've taken out the bad ingredient, and now, you know, roll up your, your sleeve. And uh, so that was my experience with him. Ed Hooper had a different experience. He actually made an arrangement to meet with Ed Hooper talking about original AIDS cases, and then he didn't show up for the appointment. And when Ed went back to his hotel room, Gary shows up at the hotel room saying, you know, this was, this is a cloak and dagger thing, and I had to test you, and that's why I'm here now. So, um, so Gary is an, an unusual individual. Like I said, Ebola, you know, AIDS, anthrax, he's somehow, he's a virologist, but he's somehow into all these um, highly um, controversial uh, organisms and seems to want to create, you know, push the government line on whatever it is he's doing. Like my lab had nothing to do with the Ebola outbreak in Kenema, Sierra Leone. Okay, well, thanks. Let's, for, let's transition back to the funding for the coronavirus research, which really, literally goes back over two decades. Um, and I think that's an important point to discuss because it gives us some insights as to whether or not there is, is a violation of the federal treaty for agents. 
Yeah. So the uh, I, the U.S. was funding this research. I mean, they really were up until uh, nineteen or two thousand fourteen. Obama stopped it, and it was stopped for three years, and, it, when it, and, it, and then it was revectored again in 2017. But during that time in 2014, I believe the funding shifted to China, the Wuhan Virology Institute. So from um, and I, the the, two, the classic 2015 North Carolina University of North Carolina paper with with Barrick and uh, Dr. Shi Zengli, you know, and then uh, the, all that was funded by with with the essentially uh, the U, U.S. funding. So I'm wondering if you can, if you can give us your perspective on that. Okay. Um, coronavirus research over the last 20 years has been done in many countries in Europe, in many labs in the U.S., um, in Japan, Singapore, China, and probably other places. And it has often been funded by by multiple funders. So funders have included the Australian government, um, different branches of NIH, uh, but primarily Fauci's NIAID, the National Science Foundation, and USAID, um, surprisingly, because you would think USAID is an aid agency. Um, there have also been organizations like the Eco Health Alliance, which have served as pass-throughs for the funding, so that um, NIAID um, or USAID would give money to Eco Health Alliance, and then Eco Health Alliance would dole it out to the um, BSL-4 lab in Wuhan um, and other places, and would participate with them in research. And most uh, most of the most prominent researchers have gone back and forth. It's, it's very complicated. Um, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot of back and forth, and, and Europe has funded this research too. So, um, you know, uh, Dr. Shi, uh, I don't know how to pronounce her name exactly, Shengli Z um, has worked in the United States, and our researchers have worked in China. Uh, Ian Lipkin has a, uh, a you know, a post in China. Um, and he was um, an expert who advised the Saudis on MERS, which is another cousin of SARS, and advised the Chinese on SARS. And he was over in China at the beginning of this epidemic doing something uh, regarding SARS too. Um, Ed, uh, so Ed Holmes works with them. Uh, so these people work together. They're funded, the Chinese, the Australians, the Europeans, and the Americans fund all this work. I can't explain to you why that happens and what are the underlying goals. What I can say is that there may be interest uh, on the part of all these countries to be able to keep an eye on what everyone else is doing so that by encouraging scientists to work in these different labs, they think and develop friendships, personal relationships, and, and all of this joint funding. Some of this research is funded by five different institutes from you know, three or four different countries. Uh, I assume that that may be part of it. But in any, so getting back to what you said about the research funding and then being cut off, gain of function research has been controversial since, it, since it, it began being discussed. In 2014, in the United States only, and for NIH only, there was a pause on gain-of-function research for three organisms only, and those were MERS, SARS, and avian flu. Probably because they were getting to a point where these things had had been developed to be aerosolized and more virulent. And there was a lot of uh, controversy in the scientific literature. However, um, even though, I don't know, about 20 research projects were stopped, a number of them, maybe half, were then given permission to continue. And Ralph Barrick's work with the Chinese researchers was one of those that was given permission to continue during this three-year slowdown. And back at the end of 2017, um, 
the slowdown was taken away and everybody was allowed to go back and do whatever gain of function research they wanted. Okay, well, thanks for that clarification. Uh, I suspect you've um, reviewed Ju uh, Judy Mikovits's uh, thesis in her new book, Plague of Corrup Corruption, which is now the number one best-selling book in the whole country, uh, has gained great attention. Her large numbers of interviews that she's given have mostly been censored and taken down, at least from conventional platforms like YouTube. So it's her contention that this SARS-CoV-2 is not the sole arbiter, not arbiter, but cause of the COVID-19, but it's, it's actually a co-infection with, and she believes that pre-existing infection with a, a gamma retrovirus from mouse, XMRV or mice, uh, were, uh, is necessary. And she uses uh, as a support for that thesis that the cytokine storm signature of COVID-19 is not consistent with the coronavirus, but very consistent with the gamma retrovirus. In fact, one that she characterized. So I'm wondering if uh, you could share your perspective on that. Um, Joe, I watched her interview with you and I saw she made your head spin. And <laughs> well, thank you. Well, she's got a lot of information and I, it seems she is sincere. Yes. She, at least I believe I so. and, and, and she's very bright. She's a profoundly knowledgeable molecular biologist, absolutely committed and not, not a micro down in my mind that she has integrity and would never do something knowingly that violated that. Um, right. So, you know, what she says is very interesting. Some of it I think is, is incorrect and some of it is correct. And there's so much of it um, that it's very hard to, to separate. Uh, I think it, it's certainly possible that the XMRV co-infection is necessary for various illnesses. And, and that, I mean, I've worked on chronic fatigue for decades and you know, nobody understands that. And if XMRV is, is the answer, that'd be great. Um, and she says she treated uh, Whittemore's child and that child got better. If that's true, I'm not sure why she's holding back on what the treatment is. Um, I don't think she's I, holding back. She, 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 she's mentioned it before and, you know, has a protocol. Part of it, I think, is the interferon. Yeah. So uh, alpha and beta interferons are being trialed in this infection, um, mostly in other countries, mostly because the alpha interferon, the, the primary alpha interferon being used um, comes from China, and now there's a, not China, Cuba, and there's a China-Cuba uh, a collaboration that's making some alpha interferon now. So um, it may be hard in the United States to find out how well that works. But um, overall, I guess I, I want to say that you can make it, even though she says coronaviruses don't do X, Y, and Z, this is a very new coronavirus. This has some unique features. Um, what we've talked about so far is only relevant to the spike protein, which is only 13% of the genome. We haven't even begun to explore changes that may have occurred in the rest of the genome. So um, I don't think we have the evidence yet to, to say that um, this coronavirus alone can't do what it seems to be doing. Well, from my understanding, the other, there's only two other prime or three other modifications. One relates to the HIV envelope protein, GP141, and uh, which has to do with infectivity. The fact that it was aerosolized, and there's the chairman of the Department of Harvard, Charles Lieber, who was arrested actually uh, in connection with this. Uh, uh, and then uh, the, thir the, the other part is the, which you mentioned was the the fur furan cleavage site, which has to do with infectivity. So it's, it seems like almost all the other manipulations were related in it's infectivity, not pathogenicity. So I'm just, you just, you just think it um, Well, well so, see, I, I don't know enough, but some people are saying there, there can, there are two or three or four small six to 10 um, 
amino acid segments that look like bits of HIV and that these may, are they're inserted in different places. They may have effects on the immune response. You know, I don't know. I think that information will gradually appear. Okay. So is that the primary uh, concern you have with what she's saying or are there other areas you have contention with? Yeah, it, like you, I, I think Judy Mikovits is very um, sincere. And so I don't, people, you know, <laughs> everyone's asking everyone now, you know, please uh, tell us what's right and wrong about her statements. And I just don't think it's my role to get into that. I think um, the government, I I mean, there's already been lots and lots of articles trying to make her seem like a crazy person. No, Uh, there's there's a massive discreditation campaign going on her. Right. From mainstream media. I mean, everything. I've I've even heard that YouTube has inserted ads into the, left some of her videos up and inserted ads discrediting her right in the middle of the video. Exactly. So, um, <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. And yeah. I think, um, you know, I've got to spend some more time lo- reading the book, not just listening to the interviews and seeing what the um, data show. And underst- I mean, I, you know, in my own research, I have found, you know, Anthony Fauci to be um, a, a hypocritical fraud. Um, who pretends he knows nothing about coronaviruses and he's funded, you know, over a hundred million dollars of coronavirus research out of NIAID. So um, there he is. He looks so gentle and he doesn't give you any details about anything, but he knows a lot of details. So I think, you know, I'd, I'd like her to be right on those areas. Okay. Well, you've done research in vaccines before, certainly with the anthrax vaccine. And I'm wondering, what your take is on this new fast track vaccine, which everyone was saying was going to be taking 18 months. And even that was beyond fast and really aborting most any safety precautions, but it's beyond far beyond worse than that because they are already doing human trials with the vaccine that they anticipate to have in the next three to four months. Yes, and started in March. Um, They're doing human trials of at least two vaccines in the US now. So I'll tell you what I know. First of all, it's the first one, the Moderna was an mRNA vaccine. We haven't had an mRNA vaccine before. So we don't know what that's gonna do in people. And therefore it seems inconscionable to give it to people before you put it in animals so that you can at least have some idea what the side effects might be. there are about 80 vaccines in development that I've, I've read about all sorts of vaccines. There were uh, many trials, not just um, the trial at Galveston with Peter Hotez, where they tried four different types of vaccines against coronaviruses and they all failed. Um, but there have been other types of, of vaccine platforms that have been used that also failed. Um, can we just stop there for a moment? Because I believe yeah. Robert F. Kennedy went over that one of those trials, and it was it was worse than failed. They gave the uh, vaccine to ferrets, I believe, and they got an incredibly great humoral antibody response. But then when they gave them, the, they were exposed to the natural infection. They all died. Yes, and Atotes also says in their animal experiments, the animals were worse when they when they were exposed to the disease than if they had not gotten the vaccine, so, or vaccines. Um, Hotez also says that that reminds people of experiments that were done in the 1960s with an RSV vaccine, which was given to children and several of the children died. Um, again, with the same sort of cytokine storm problem uh, arising. So I think there's, you know, this is a vaccine you should tread very lightly with and uh, should never have been given to people before it was given to animals. I want to talk about, though, the methods in the United States for doing human subjects research. Sure. So 
uh, used to be there were IRB, the go federal government set up an IRB system. Um, every university had one of these and, and faculty members and an ethics person and maybe a community member would be part and they would have to sign off on all the human trials uh, before they were done. They had to get permission. But, and that, you know, kept most of them honest, not all of them. And there were often conflicts of interest because the university might have a financial stake in the outcome. But then the United States allowed commercial IRBs. So you can just go to a company and ask them to approve your clinical trial. And then the United States government allowed commercial clinical trial companies. So you don't have to get anywhere near an academic to perform a trial in human beings. All you have to do is go to commercial IRB and a commercial uh, research organization, and there are many of them. They are particularly prevalent in the South and in poor pl places where um, subjects can earn a little money by agreeing to be human subjects. And so these actually have become large companies with many sites. And it is these types of uh, organizations that are, are used for the most uh, potentially heinous clinical trials. And we have no idea what they're telling people when they sign them up to be subjects. So I think it, it's a real problem people, sh uh, before you agree to be a subject in any clinical trial, you should really discuss it with other people. Be sure you know exactly what you're getting into. In general, even if you are injured, disabled, or die in a clinical trial, you're not subject, you are not eligible for any federal payments. Um, there have been attempts to try to make that happen, but, it, but they have failed. So it, it, people take a lot of risks when they get into a clinical trial, and particularly a clinical trial like the ones that are going on now at a high speed before there are even animal uh, trials and probably very limited uh, phase one trials. Uh, I, would, I would just warn your listeners, be very careful about agreeing to join a trial. Thank you for your caution, and I would add that it uh, should be extended beyond just participating in experimental vaccine trials, but also uh, to pretty much almost every interaction with the conventional medical system because they have abandoned the true meaning of informed consent and full disclosure of the entire consequences of engaging in many of these interventions is hardly ever given. And if they do, it's just the tiniest tip of the iceberg. So I couldn't, couldn't endorse that caution more, more thoroughly. So extending beyond that, though, I'm wondering what your thoughts are. And, and, and thanks for summarizing these trials. I mean, it looks like the vaccine, this SARS-CoV-2 vaccine is coming out this year. So your thoughts on whether you think it will be, and I know it's probably beyond your scope of Right, we can't expertise. imagine. You know, if it's going we don't know what it's going to be. Um, yeah. I'll just point out Ralph Barrick, who is uh, the top corona researcher in the United States at the University of North Carolina, said himself in an interview a couple months ago that um, vaccines aren't going to work in the older population for which this disease is, is most risky. That's a really profound pearl. Thank you for sharing that. The top expert in the United States states that it will not work. Yet they're not listening to him, even though he's part of the cabal. He's part in of the, the elderly. Cabal. Yes. No. That's was, correct. That was the question in the elderly. And that's, in the clearly, elderly. that's clearly their target population. That, that's where 70 to 80 percent of deaths are occurring. Right. So do you have any other thoughts about the vaccine coming up? But that was a good one. That was a really good one. I'm going to use that. Um, well, having uh, dealt with many people who've died, who have developed seizure disorders, all sorts of terrible complications from anthrax vaccine and smallpox vaccine and sometimes other vaccines, um, I try to do a careful risk-benefit analysis before recommending a vaccine to any patient. I mean, sometimes I think it makes sense for people to be vaccinated, but that their own situation, where they live, their age group, who they're exposed to, where they're traveling to are all important 
um, features that would help you to, to create that risk benefit assessment. And uh, I don't think vaccines should be looked on as risk free. They're clearly not risk free. Um, uh, medical interventions and should be done thoughtfully. Oh, let me also point out that talking about these uh, characters that I discussed earlier, Ian Lipkin, one of the authors of the Nature Med piece, has been used to publish about chronic fatigue syndrome and autism. And he spent uh, 10 or more years looking for an infectious cause of autism, um, excess weight in the mother or maybe in the father, uh, all sorts of things, but not vaccines. Um, so again, I think he is likely, when you look at what these folks investigate, that Lipkin or Bob Gary in particular, you'll see they're they just jump from one thing like vaccines to um, Ebola, to SARS, you know, to, to Gulf War syndrome. I mean, they're, they're jumping from one highly controversial subject to the next and always pushing the government line on what that is. And usually the line that there is no treatment. So, um, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Vaccines are, once you inject a vaccine, you can't take it out, at least with drugs. If for most of them, the effect wears off uh, in a short time. Yeah. Well, what Judy helped me understand that I, what I got from interviewing her is that most of these vaccines are created in cell cultures. They, they require nutrients to grow and, and to scale up their volume so they can be uh, commercialized. And the process of incubating them in these animal cell cultures is that they are likely to inquire whatever viruses were present in that animal. As you mentioned in the book in the river where these monkey and chimpanzees cells were used to culture the, the um, smallpox virus, but it was no, contaminated. No, polio. With, Oral polio. I'm sorry, polio, polio. I'm sorry, sorry, polio. But it was contaminated with SIV, simian, yes. simian immunodeficiency virus. So uh, and God that's knows just one example. Else. Yeah, that's just one example. Who knows what other retroviruses or contaminants were in, the, you know, were in that that we haven't even yet begun to understand or characterize. So that's, that's a danger. It's an unknown risk. We have no understa complete understanding or, care or clue as to what's in the, these things because of the way that they're being created. Now, you could create them in a, in a different way, but they're choosing not to do that for whatever, right. most likely right. financial. Right. So... Um, I want to give you another pearl. I'm going to have to go to my computer because okay. uh, on the FDA website, there is a page that talks about the problem of growing vaccines in cells that uh, may have oncogenes so, or cancer-causing viruses and what, they're, what kind of research they're trying to do to deal with this. So they acknowledge that that goes on on the FDA website. Yeah. Yeah, it's just crazy. And you've mentioned Lipkin a few times and... Uh, that is the scientist that was used to discredit Mikovits in her yes. research and, yes, and basically exactly. allow her to get her 2009 science paper retracted. And she was forced to be a co-author on the paper that Lipkin authored, even though she was essentially in lockdown and couldn't go to the lab and participate in doing the research. Yes. And, um, and Lipkin also has been involved with Peter Daszak, that Lipkin has given Dazak a, a position in his little organization at Columbia. And Dazak is transferring funds. Uh, Lipkin is also getting lots of funds from NIAID, but Dazak is transferring funds to do all of this corona research around the world, as well as NI, NIH directly funding and others. Yeah, he got a $30 million grant after publishing the paper that discredited Mikovits. So yes. <laughs> a pretty generous yes. reward for him. <laughs> But the, the craziness goes on. So, um, so do you have any other insights you'd like to share with us? Because you know you've been doing this a long time, and you really uh, are a credible source of solid information that's that's uh, based in reality. So, well, you know, thirty years ago, when I was writing papers about the potential risks of, of biological defense research we had a lot less biological defense research going on. And um, 
the risks were, were significant. Uh, e everybody agrees that these labs leak. I told you there were uh, maybe 600 or more BSL-3s in the United States and hundreds of others around the world. So um, let, me, let me actually give you a few examples from a paper by Martin Fermansky, who is a, a, a physician who looked at uh, lab escapes. He pointed out that there, there was a lab in England and there were several smallpox escapes from that lab to a room below and that uh, two people died. And after the second uh, one happened, I think it was around 1980, the lab director killed himself. Uh, that there were huge outbreaks of Venezuelan equine encephalitis, thousands and thousands of people um, in Latin America, and it turned out all to be due to uh, improperly inactivated vaccines. So the disease they were vaccinating all these livestock for was actually giving them the disease and giving it to humans also. Thousands and thousands. You don't hear about that. Um, he points out that the 1977 um, H1N1 outbreak. You know, every year there's a, a flu pandemic. And in 1977, uh, the pandemic started in China or Russia, probably from vaccine that had been defrosted, because that particular strain had not been, H1N1 had not been around in the world for 21 years. And genetically, it looked almost identical to the strains that were a, around in the late 40s and 1950s, early 50s. So that whole pandemic was a lab escape. Um, uh, is, is that the pandemic that actually caused the catastrophic swine flu vaccine and had lots of complications so, like the Bar 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 syndrome? So, um, it, no, it wasn't the same. It was because it started in uh, the borderland of Russia and China. We made our own, but it was probably uh, done in the expectation that we were going to have uh, an outbreak. And so they were trying to, whoever, you know, took it out of the freezer was, tr was probably, that's the, the implication, trying to uh, make a vaccine for 1977. Our swine flu was 1977. It was, I think, 76 where the recruit died at Fort Dix. And then, you know, all the machinery of the United States government and the manufacturers got together to create very rapidly a um, swine flu vaccine to save the United States. And, uh, you abysmal know, failure, failure. Abysmal fa first of all, there was no outbreak. Yeah. So had the um, people at the CDC and HHS been honest with the American public, they would have told them, hey, there's no outbreak. We're just going to cancel the vaccine program. You don't need it. But it had developed a life of its own. Um, uh, Harvey Feinberg, I believe, co-authored this fabulous book about it for the National Academy of Sciences um, that the next uh, DHHS secretary had requested. And I, I recommend, I mean, it's a, it's a fabulous read because he, in, he had, because he was working under the Secretary of Health and Human Services, he was able to interview everybody in government. And he tells you the inside story of what went on during that year all the infighting, all, all the different reasons why a vaccine was made for a disease that didn't exist, and then given, and then found to cause Guillain-Barre, and 4,000 people applied for um, money back from the gov government. This was the first time the government um, gave a liability waiver to vaccine manufacturers. And I think it was what gave them the idea that in the future they could get liability waivers for all their vaccines. Yeah, they eventually got passed in 1986 and it serves as the foundation for their insulation from any <laughs> liability for damages from the, from the, with the product that they're providing. So if, if your vaccine is um, on the childhood schedule, according to CDC, you are fully, you have your liability waived. But as of the 2016, um, 21st Century Cures Act, if the CDC recommends any vaccine for a pregnant woman, liability is waived for that vaccine. And 
you can license a vaccine using real world evidence and you don't necessarily have to do clinical trials to license vaccines according to that act which was passed and signed by Obama in December of 2016. And as soon as every new vaccine is licensed, the CDC is required to put it in front of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices at their next meeting for consideration to be added to the childhood schedule. So we can look forward perhaps to many more vaccines being waived and, especially, and also there's a special waiver program for pandemic and emergency vaccines and drugs. So all the vaccines, all the drugs that are designated for use during this pandemic will have a waiver of liability. And um, as far as I know, this hasn't changed. The maximum a person can get is 250,000 for the government, even for a death or permanent uh, total disability. Yeah. That's if they're successful in the court, which is yes. and there's and it's not the vaccine court. You don't go to vaccine court for this. You actually have to apply to HHS. So HHS pays you. HHS is a ju judge and the jury, and there is no appeal. <laughs> this is just. This is, I know it boggles the mind. This is dystopian science fiction in reality. It's just crazy. So I, I'm wondering if you think an effort to shut down these 600 BSL-3 and 4 labs in the U.S. is an, is an overambitious goal. Well, I don't know if you need to shut all of them down. I think probably there is plenty of valid research that could be done in them, but I think there needs to be oversight. There needs to be an end of gain of function research. I, th I think it uh, maybe if this is bad, if the people realize, if the population understands that this is what your, your Congress and your scientists have given us just because everyone was trying to do a CYA, you know, the Congress was trying to throw money at a problem. Nobody was doing oversight. And the, all these agencies, there are eight agencies at the um, uh, level of uh, uh, secretaries, you know, like the VA, HHS, Homeland Security, FEMA, there's eight different agencies that are responsible for doing some pandemic preparedness and 15 other organizations within the federal government. But much of this was spent just buying things uh, like anthrax and smallpox vaccine that, ha that are probably unnecessary, very expensive, would never be used, and not buying personal protective equipment and things that should be used. There's hundreds of, uh, about two or three hundred million dollars a year designated for hospital preparedness in these funds, but it doesn't get spent on, on the things we would normally consider it, it should be spent on. So um, I think that if all the countries of the world got together because all their populations are so angry about what has happened and said, we don't want any more of this and everybody can inspect, inspect everybody else's labs, we can all make sure that what you're doing is actually gonna be um, pro-life instead of anti-life, uh, we would be a lot better off. And maybe that's possible. And you don't have to shut them down, you have to reduce the numbers all over and uh, you know, I'm sorry. There may be virologists without of a job, without a job. But um, you know, that's happened before. When the U.S. biological warfare program was shut down, there were scientists without a job. But maybe there shouldn't be death scientists. Yeah. Well, that that reminds me to cover some a question, an earlier question I had for you. It's out of context now, but still relevant. Is the Fact, the fact of employment, uh, especially connected with the anthrax vaccine, there's speculation that the person who was incriminated for doing this was a former employee in the anthrax program who was terminated, and he was doing this as a result, speculated to get his job back. And then, uh, right. the same course, coming back to this, other people are speculating that it was it was maybe not accidentally released at all, but was maybe released by one of the virologists or employees in, at Wuhan, 
who was out of a job and recognizing that if they uh, you know, sort of creating a market for their services and be, become reemployed again. I'm wondering what your thoughts on, on, on that speculation is. Okay, I, I can't say about Wuhan, but um, as far as the anthrax attacks go, the person who was ultimately um, accused um, after, he di- after he died, after he was driven to his death um, by the FBI was Bruce Ivins, who was a friend of mine. And um, it turned, and the FBI actually never had any proof that Ivins had done it, nor that the anthrax actually even came from the flask that they said it came from that was in Ivan's possession, but was um, available to over a hundred other people. So when the National Academy of Sciences report came out a year after the FBI decided to close the case, and they, the FBI did that because they knew they didn't want to deal with what was going to be in that report, the National Academy of Sciences group said, we can't say where this anthrax came from. So the who was the perpetrator or what group was the perpetrator and the United States government did have stores of anthrax. Um, it had a. It probably had a store that it had retained in 1975 after it had hidden in Becton Dickinson. After the biological weapons program was shut down, they they selectively saved some toxins and bad things and put them in the private hands. That's been documented in a, in a congressional hearing, and I, I cited that in a, a testi- congressional testimony I gave in 2001. And we also had anthrax that uh, had been made during a probably illegal program during the Clinton administration. And certainly there could have been other anthrax um, made here or in other countries. And a cabal got it and used it to perpetrate the anthrax letters. So, um, you know, I, it's easy to, to blame P- I mean, the FBI needed, a, needed somebody to blame. He, Bruce Ivins was the third or fourth different person that they had decided to focus on because they kept losing their earlier uh, people. They, they tried to set up a number of people to take the blame for that case. So I don't know about Wuhan. I tend to think that... Um, these big things are probably done by big organizations rather than individual lone, lone nuts. Yeah, that would make more sense. More of a coordinated, sophisticated plan. Yes. Which, interestingly, was the title of Judy's uh, interview that made her really catapulted her to fame was Plandemic. Uh, interesting plan words. So uh, that is implying that there's that there this was uh, intended and it was it wasn't happening spontaneously and the, the events like 201, which happened six weeks before the infection, would lend tend lend support to that since it was funded by the World Economic Forum, Johns Hopkins, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Right. Yeah. All right, any other insights you'd like to share with us today? I think I'm burned out. Okay, all right. Well, we really appreciate you for sharing your wisdom that you've acquired over those last three decades in this important area because there's so much confusion. And I think you really helped clarify some issues for many of us. So thank you for that. Thank you, Joe. Take care.